one of those stories that we get where I want to put a question mark after that line, the gospel of the Lord. Gospel means good news, and I don't know about you, but when I hear this parable, it makes me a little squirmy, and it doesn't sound tremendously comforting. And that's because parables are designed to be challenging. Parables are designed to confront us and to push us and to pry us open a little bit so that something different can make its way in. But it's good to remember a few things about this parable. First of all, when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king, it's important to remember that compared to, this is not a direct equivalence. God is like a king who slaughters the people who rebel and throws people out of banquets on a whim. There's something about this story that comes from life around you. You live in an empire. The story of tyrants is not unusual. There's something about this story that's supposed to catch Jesus' audience and to, to help them think. But we, we need to listen to it before we can decide what that is. And it's helpful for us to remember, too, the context of what's happening. Jesus has engaged in a teach-in. He has occupied the temple during Holy Week. This is a series of, of parables that we get from Holy Week where Jesus has come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, already a strange thing, marched into the temple and thrown over the tables in the most angry version of Jesus we get in Scripture. Then sat down started healing people who don't belong in the temple, who are lame and blind and shouldn't be there because they are not ritually clean. And now he is sitting there and teaching as if he belongs there day after day. And he's just plunked himself down and has enough people with him that it's a little bit of a dare. What are you going to do about it? Right? The, the uh, other parables that we have heard... We get the line, well, the Pharisees and the chief priests wanted to X, Y, or Z, but because of the people, they, mm, they weren't sure they could say that. So Jesus piles story on top of story on top of story, each one a little bit more exaggerated to try to get through to these people who come to him, these chief priests, and say, who do you think you are? What authority, Jesus, do you have to be in this place doing what you are doing? or frankly, any of the things that you have been doing for the last three years. Who do you think you are? And Matthew, as he gives it to us, gives us a version that is full of his community's frustration, his Jewish community that he lives in and leads, with trying to understand how to follow Jesus, be the Jews that they were made to be, and relate to the religious leadership of the day. And so there's frustration and there's struggle in all of what Matthew writes. And we have to be really careful because the Christian church for centuries has used texts like these to talk about the sort of destruction that is going on in a story like this to justify really awful anti-Semitism. And that's one of those things that as Christians we have to confess regularly and often because we forget very easily and we do a great job of saying well that was then this is now not if you listen to the news now is then too so we need to be honest that that we have misused this story that jesus is not telling against jews right these are the religious leaders he is frustrated with and the people who have been invited in as a second pass are all the ones that are following jesus Jesus does not go around collecting Gentiles. That happens much later. Jesus has collected the people on the margins who were Jewish. Tax collectors, sinners, women, the occasional stray Pharisee that's a little intrigued and keeps following him around asking questions. So this is not a story about God saying to fooey on those people, I'm done with them and go ahead and do whatever you'd like. That is absolutely not it. So we just need to know that. And it's good for us too to be thoughtful about not equating the God that we know in Jesus with the king in this parable. Not at least item for item. Because the king in this parable is rather smitey, right? He, he, he doesn't just get offended when people rebel, and that's what they did. There was a political rebellion by turning down his invitation. He levels them, the entire community, done, gone. And for people living under Roman rule, they know all about that. 
And for Jewish people who have long been, been soaking in the, the anticipation of the good king that God sends, the Messiah, they know this is not gracious, merciful, slow to anger, or abounding in steadfast love. So this is not the peace we're supposed to take away. So what are we? I think that Jesus wants the religious leaders to hear, and Matthew wants his community to hear the reminder. Don't think that your place at the table is anything besides grace. Do not walk around like you own the kingdom of God. And that is, to some extent, his experience, Jesus' experience of his own religious leaders. And that's certainly Matthew's experience of all people who want to follow Jesus. Very quickly, we start to act as if we own Jesus and we know everything and we are right. Don't act as if your place at the table is anything other than grace. As we read Psalm 23, I thought about this beautiful attitude of, of gratefulness and dependence on God. And I thought how much we love those words and how we, we work to memorize them sometimes when we're young or when we're older, how we might hang on to them in the middle of the night when there's nothing else and we don't have the words, how we might write them down and hand to our loved ones to say, when I am a part of the fulfillment of the kingdom and you are giving thanks to God for my life, I want you to hear this because this is what I believe. We treasure these words. Also, we make tacky art with them. And we treat them, you know, we, we put them everywhere, and sometimes they lose a little of their weight. And I think part of that is because it's really actually very different from how we are trained to think in our culture. The Lord is my shepherd? Well, no, I'm the master of my own, my own destiny. I am a self-made man. I shall not want? No. We're supposed to take care of our own first, aren't we? He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. No, no, no. I worked for what I have, right? He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Well, I'm right, that part, yes. But everybody knows you should be a leader, not a follower. And anyone who wants to point out that my path has involved stepping over other people, well, they're just whiners. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. No, 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 be afraid. We hear that again and again. Be afraid, shoot first, ask questions later. If you don't look out for number one, no one else will. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, you are with me. Who would admit? honestly, to being in a dark valley. If you're in a dark valley in this culture, we assume you did something to deserve it. This isn't a dark valley. I'm fine. Very fine. Really, I'm fine. Sound familiar? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Now, we all know that the solution to an overflowing cup is to get a bigger cup mega super big gulp with one of those extendable straws, and you put it in the fridge for later. And if that fridge is full, then you put it in the basement fridge. And if that's not available, there's a chest freezer in the garage. There is no such thing as too much of a good thing. I can keep it all. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. All my days? You know, I'm really not sure I can commit to that party on Thursday. It sounds great. I'm really happy you're having a birthday, but there, there might be something else coming up, and I need to keep my options open. If it rains, you'll see us then. <sighs> this attitude of the psalmist, of dependence on God, of gratitude, and even this expectation that goodness and mercy are going to follow. I don't know if he means that goodness and mercy are following him and tending to him, or that he assumes that he will trail goodness and mercy behind him, but I kind of hope it's the second. That's not an easy attitude for us, is it? 
Again and again in the parables that Jesus tells in the temple, he is showing his frustration with the reality that the people who should be the most faithful cannot or will not receive the table that is spread in front of them. The words, the very presence of goodness and mercy incarnate. And so the story of the king goes along, as people expect. In this world, when you rebel, there is bloodshed. Great, yep, okay, so far we're tracking with you, Jesus. We know how that goes. And then we get to the snag. The party happens after all. And the riffraff are rounded up. The good and the bad, those people out on the fringes of town, that one guy just passing through, everybody is coming to this banquet. Jesus' ragtag collection of tax collectors and prostitutes, wealthy women, and, and hangers-on, Roman God-fearers trying to figure out what is going on, they're all there because they know a banquet when they see one. They know a feast when they see one. They recognize a shepherd and follow because they know what it's like not to have one. They have experienced this amazing surprise that in their darkest valleys they could literally look over and say to Jesus, you are with me. That is a gift. It's amazing. And you know and I know that we are the ones gathered in from hither and yon. We are the good and the bad. And somehow the king has decided, despite the way the world always works, that this is going to be different. It's almost hard to understand that first crowd, isn't it? The ones that didn't want to come, there's a place at the table. How do you walk away from that? What are you thinking? You know that walking away from goodness and mercy means walking towards something else, don't you? Those people. Clearly, we belong here. We get it. That's how fast it happens, isn't it? We go from celebrating the stunning generosity of God to feeling self-righteous in a blink, don't we? From deep gratitude to this sense of entitlement in just a breath. I belong here and you are wrong. So, so easy. And Matthew knows it because he's living it with his community. And so he gives us this tag at the end of the parable. This fellow who has been invited to the feast and is clothed in the mercy of the host. Doesn't belong there. Pulled in off the streets. Clothed in some bizarre generosity. Unexpected. We wear white at baptism. We put a white pall on a coffin at a funeral because we understand that we're here because we're clothed in God's generosity. But this fellow is at the wedding feast and he's wearing a shirt that says, I'm just here for the snacks. I don't need your mercy and I don't intend to go around wearing mercy for other people either. Matthew knows how quickly we make that shift, how easily His community can go from joy in God's grace to being sure that they earned it, that they're entitled to it, that they can refuse to live lives of grace for other people and still sit down at that table as if they own the place. So the good news for us this morning is that we are gathered in from all of the byways of this world by a ruler who is willing somehow to make a place for us, good and bad, We who have no reason to be invited to a royal banquet, we can't offer any sort of exchange. We have nothing to trade for the generosity that would have been expected in trade from the people first invited. But the challenge this morning is not to sit down like we own the place, but rather to be clothed in the mercy that God has given us and join in the celebration rather than licking our finger and touching this cookie touching that cookie, touching that cookie. All the cookies are my cookies. We slide into that so easily. And so our invitation this morning is to remember that it is the Lord who is our shepherd and that the goodness and mercy that follow us ought to be trailing us in our ways of relating to the world as well, that we might actually dwell in the house of the Lord our whole life long and not just come for the cookies. Thanks be to God.